vertical integration. So we're going to learn some new, new rules besides um, Trapezoid and Simpson. So this is somewhat different way of thinking. Okay. It's due to Gauss, the giant. Okay. So let's um, recall what we have done so far. The two rules that we know about say the trapezoid and the Simpson's rule. Let's consider the interval AB is a subinterval. Okay, that's the interval, the basic local interval that you apply the trapezoid or Simpson. Let's look at trapezoid, for example. Mm -hmm. So, um, what is your rule? Your trapezoid for this function f would be um, b minus a over two f at a plus f at b. Is that right? That's the basic trapezoid rule. Just a linear interpolation, <coughs> you get the area of the trapezoid. Okay. And what about Simpson? Mm -hmm. The Simpson. So what we did was we had a in the, in the midpoint exactly. So it's b minus a over two is the h is h over three, so it's over six of f at a plus four times the middle point and the point on the right. Is that right? That's the Simpson's rule. So they kind of follow this pattern, which I'm going to explain now. So what the rules are doing will be, say for this rule here, it chooses two points, A and B, on the subinterval where you evaluate the function. And after you evaluate it, each of them is multiplied by a coefficient, that's a number, and this is multiplied by this number, and then I add them up. Is that right? And same thing happened here, except I have three points, A, the midpoint, and B. And then this function here, evaluation at A, is multiplied by this coefficient, and this one is multiplied by four times that, and this one is multiplied by that. Okay? So it seems like all these rules have this general form. Okay, so the integral from a to b of the function fx dx is approximated. Let's be general. Say I have n points with n coefficients in front. So a0 fx0 plus a1 fx1 plus dot 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 plus a n f x n. Is that okay? So for trapezoid rule n equals to one, and I have two points, right? Let's let's put plug back in for trapezoid. How does it fit fit into this general formula? Well, x zero is a, and x one is b. I have n equals to one there, so I only have two points, and then my a zero equals to a one, which is b minus a over two. Is that right? And the Simpsons in a similar way. I'm not going to write out. Okay? So, so let me give some terminology, terms, uh, names we call. We call these uh, XIs, we call them, they are nodes, and uh, what they are multiplied with, this constant here, AIs, they are called weights. Okay. So in the trapezoid and the Simpson's rule, the way we derive it, if you remember how we derive it, was the following. We fix the nodes. Is that right? So for trapezoid rule, we say we're going to fix A and B, and we're going to find a polynomial that interpolates it, which is, turns out to be a linear polynomial because you have two points. And for the Simpsons, we also fix the points, fix A, the midpoint, and the B, and we fit in a quadratic polynomial. So in a way, you fix the nodes first, and then you try to find the weights to achieve certain accuracy. Is that right? Okay, so the old way, the previous way, is 
I fix all these xi's, and then I try to find the weights ai. Okay, once the xi's are fixed, and to find the ai's, well, if you have two points, you have two of these a's to fix, uh, to find, and if you have three points, you have three of these to find, which means the degree of freedom is the same as the number of points. Okay? So usually the degree of freedom, the higher degree of freedom you have, the more room for you to wiggle around, the higher accuracy you can achieve. So we're going to change our way of thinking to achieve even higher accuracy. <coughs> so the new idea now will be, I will not fix the nodes. The xi's become also part of the things that I can control, that I can select. Is that clear? So um, let all these xi's also be my choice. Okay, then I have immediately doubled my number of degree of freedom and I could achieve higher order. Is that clear? It's not such a difficult concept, but just this would lead to something really, really nice. Okay, so let me tell you this Gaussian quadrature. So I have all these nodes with the corresponding weights. So let's say, choose, how do you find the Gaussian quadrature? Choose xi, ai, i from 0, 1, all the way to capital N, such that the following rule holds. So such that um, integrating from a to b of fx dx becomes exact, equal to my rule. So let me write out my rule again. a0 fx0 plus, um, yeah, I don't have to write it again. Can I? OK, let me do it. OK, a1 fx1 plus a n f x n. So I have an equal sign for all function f, which is a polynomial of degree m. Okay, And I want to find m as large as possible. So if n is large, that means for higher order polynomial, my rule is exact. So what does it tell me? If you remember um, Taylor series, all our analysis are done around Taylor series. Taylor series is nothing but a power series, right? So if your rule is accurate for a polynomial up to degree m, that means the first m plus 1 terms in your <coughs> Taylor series is approximated actually is exact. It's not even approximated. So your error will start from the term with power m plus 1, right? So that actually tells you the degree of precision exactly. Okay? So that's this name. So this m here is called degree of precision. Actually, in the end, it's the order of your method. Okay, so let's see how, how do we choose this m. How is the m related to how many points um, in the Gaussian quadrature that we have to choose? Okay, so um, let me say this is my equation star because I'm going to go back to it. Hmm. So I know this is exact for polynomials of degree m. So let's say a polynomial, let's little pm be a general polynomial of degree m. How many um, unknowns, how many degrees of freedoms do I have? Well, if I write it out, then it's pretty clear. This would have um, m plus 1 unknowns. Is that right? m plus 1 
unknowns. These coefficients are my unknowns. Once I figure them out, I have my polynomial. Okay, so I want to show that this rule is exact for any choices of this Pn. So here comes a claim that in order to have this requirement satisfied, it's enough, it suffices to show this star here holds only for the basis functions. That is, what are the basis functions? Well, for the polynomial, these the, the power functions are the basis functions for your polynomial. Okay, so equals to one x x squared all the way to x to the power of n. So why is that? Well, you can do a little, very short proof. I'm not going to elaborate. So if your rule is exact for each of these x, so what is the integral of pm x dx over any interval, over a to b? I'm not going to write a to b everywhere. So in, I could integrate each term, and I could put the constant out because integration is linear. Right? And this is a linear combination of all the basis functions. So I will have the following. Plus, let me go to the last term, a0. Now, if my rule produces exact value for each of these basis functions, then that means each of these little integrals here are computed exact by my rule. And therefore, this one becomes exact as well. Is that clear? That just makes it much easier for you to check if your rule satisfies this condition. Okay? Okay, so we know now on the number of equations you will eventually set up will be m um, plus 1. This is not unknown, unknown from the polynomial. Um, so number of equations I can set up will be um, exactly, each of this will give me a constraint. So that will be m plus 1. And then going back, what am I trying to fit in? I'm trying to fit in all the xi's and all the ai's. How many of them do I have? Number of unknown. That's the real unknown. The degree of freedom, right? That will be 2 times n plus 1. Is that right? And it always starts from 0. It's really annoying. <laughs> always from 0 to n, so it's n plus 1 such points. Okay. So which means the polynomial you can fit in, the degree of precision in the end for your quadrature will be this minus 1. So it's 2n plus 2 minus 1. So 2n plus 1. Is that okay? Okay, so let's see how we can um, design such a rule. So I need to, let's just fix the idea and uh, work on an interval. Um, consider the interval, the unit interval from negative 1 to 1. And later on, we will project it back to any interval from A to B. Okay, so consider on that. And then we consider the simplest case where n equals to 1. Oh, n equals to 0 is too simple. Then you just choose the midpoint and piecewise constant. That's it. Nothing to do. n equals to 1 becomes a bit more interesting. Okay? So let's see. So with that, then I know that I actually need two points and two weights. Is that right? So my rule will be the following. My rule, negative 1 to 1 of fx dx will equal to, I'll have two terms, a0 fx0 plus a1 fx1. Is that right? I have two points. I have four unknowns, and I know m equals to 3. It shall be exact for all polynomials of degree 3. So 
So this should hold for all f, which is a polynomial, a fancy p, um, m is 3. Okay? So from the discussion we just had, we know we only need to check the basis function. So we need to check f of x equals to 1 x, x squared, x third. And we will end up with four equations. Is that right? Okay. So that's what we will do. Okay, so before we get into that, let's put up something useful, useful formula. Because we're going to say that if I plug it in 1 for f, it's equal. I plug in x, it's equal. So all the powers of x. So I would like to prepare myself um, to get the value on the left hand side. Okay. So if I integrate from negative 1 to 1, x to the kth power dx, what do I get? It depends on if k is even or odd, is it? If k is odd, what do I get? x to the odd power is an odd function. You integrate an odd function around the origin, symmetric to the left and right, one unit. What do you get? Zero. Zero. Do we all see the area on the left and on the right of your origin will be the same, but with opposite signs, so add up to be zero, right? So it's zero if k is odd, and then if k is even, it's an even function. You can work it out. This will be 2 over k plus 1. Is that okay? k even. Okay. So with that piece of information, now we can check. Okay, let's check now um, all these functions. f of x equals to 1, what does it give me? Well, if it's 1, then the left-hand side equals to 2. What is the right-hand side? Well, this is 1, and this is 1, right? I'll just get a 0 plus a 1. Agree? Is that okay? fx equals to x. The next function, well, k is 1, so I know the integral shall be 0. That's its exact value, right? What does my rule say? My rule is a0 times f of x0, f of x is x, put x equal to x0, this is x0, right? And then a1 times f of x1, so it's x1. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Once it's okay, we can go faster. We speed up, is it all right? So x squared, um, the exact value is 2 over 3, that we know. And uh, then I have a 0 times f of x, 0, that will be x0 squared, is that right? And a1, x1 squared, okay? The third, the last one. It's odd, k is odd, so it's 0 on the left hand side, that's the value, so I will have a0, x0 to the cube, a1, x1 to the cube. So I have four equations, I have four unknowns, right? So the degree of freedom matches, if it's well defined, I shall be able to solve it. Okay. It's not that really that simple or that nice because if you look at these equations, they are nonlinear, aren't they? You have, these are unknowns. Unknowns are multiplying with each other. Unknowns is taking a square. It's not linear. So it's not that easy to solve. Okay. But here there's a lot of symmetry, which I will point out for this case. And then we'll use it for more complicated case to simplify the computation. So let's, let's check symmetry. So among these four equations, I think 2 and 4 are the nicest one because it has 0 on the right-hand side. 
left hand side. <laughs> Usually it's the right hand side. So what does it mean? This means this guy equals to negative of this guy, and this guy equals to negative of this guy on each side of the equation, right? So I can take 4 and divide it by equation 2. Are you with me? I'm not writing it all out. Then on the left, I will get x0 square. On the right, I will get x1 square. Is it clear? I'm basically doing equation 4 over equation 2 by moving them to both sides of the equation. Okay, so this gives me x0 square equals to x1 square. So what does it mean? x0 is distinct from x1. It cannot be the same. That means they have to take the opposite sign. Is that right? That's symmetrical property, meaning the two nodes you choose must have the same distance from the origin. The origin is the center of your symmetry. Okay. And now I can plug this, say, back into equation 2. So plug in equation 2, what does it tell me? This is opposite of that, and they add up to be 0. That means a0 equals to a1. Isn't it? A0 equals to A1. So the two points are symmetric about the origin. And if it's a two symmetric point, they must carry the same weight. Another symmetric property. Okay. So pay attention. This is very useful later on. So use these symmetric properties. And then it becomes really easy to solve this equation. Once you have these two pieces of information, you put that in, you know, the a's will be 1. And uh, let me write it out over there. A, a0 equal to a1 equal to 1. And then you put this information in here. You get x0 squared shall be 1 third. You can take square root and find it out. OK. So um, let's, um, let's start from here. OK, so now we can solve it. I have a0 equals to a1 equals to 1, and x0 equals to, let's say that's the one on the left, and x1 is the one on the right. Right? Thanks to the symmetric property. Well, we observed it anyway. So what is my rule in the end? Let's write out the rule. Integral negative 1 to 1 f of x dx is approximated by evaluating f at um, negative 1 over root 3 plus f at positive 1 over root 3. And then we know. So this is exact for all polynomials of order 3. One, three. three. m equals to 3. Yes. Yeah. So degree of precision, which actually equals to order of your method, order of your approximation, is now equals to 3. That's the m. OK, so it's a third order um, approximation. Is it clear how this is being derived? Mm -hmm. Would you be able to do m n equals to 2 if I say now we take three points? Do you think you can carry it out? <laughs> I'll do it for you, but I'm just saying. Can you imagine yourself carrying out a totally similar computation? It's repetitive. So let's try that. Let's bump it up to one more, n equals to 2. So we first need to figure out um, what is the degree of precision, <coughs> m, or equals to 2 times 2 plus 1, right? So m equals to 5. Your rule will be exact for all polynomials of degree 5. Okay? It will be a fifth order method. Okay? And uh, um, the, your rule will be the following. Negative 1 to 1, f of x dx will be equal to, so we have three points. Let's denote it by x0. 
x1 and x2. And it shall equal to that for all f belongs to polynomial 5. Okay? So from the previous discussion, we already know we just need to check um, the basis functions. But we're going to be smarter than that. We'll reduce our work. So we only need to check fx equals to 1, x, x square, x third, x fourth, x fifth. That would give me six equations, wouldn't it? It's a lot. I do not want to do that. I want to be smarter than that. Let's see. We use the symmetric property. Okay, you can verify it, but we'll just use it. So the pr symmetric property we observed here for n equals to 1, and we assume that it's true for others, higher m's, which means the distribution of nodes has to be symmetric about origin. Now you have three points. How will they have to be distributed so it's symmetric about origin? This one has to be zero. The mid one has to be zero. Is that clear? You already know immediately, a priori. So x1 must be zero. And then you know x0 and x2 must lie around it with the same distance from the origin. OK? What about the weights? Can I say anything about A1? No, it doesn't say. It's not symmetric with anything. What about A0 and A2? So you would say immediately x1 has to be here, x0 and x2 has to be symmetric about that. That's the origin. And what about the A0? and A2, if it's symmetric, they have to be the same, right? Okay, so we already immediately know three equations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's write out our rule. Our rule becomes, let me just write our rule now becomes the following. Um, if I use these, so A0, F of X0 plus A1, f of 0 plus a2 is just a0, f of negative x0. That's my rule now. Okay? I have only three unknowns to fix a0, a1, and x0. And I tell you that this rule is exact, actually, for all odd functions. Not odd functions, okay. For all um, x to the k, where k is odd. Which are odd functions, so it's not that hard to verify because you can just plug that in. What would you have will be a0 f of x0 plus f of 0 is 0, so middle term is 0. If it's odd, you can move the negative sign to the front, right? So it becomes minus a0 f of x0, which equals to 0, which is the exact value for the integral. Is that right? So for all the odd powers, I don't need to check. So I'm, now I nail down what I really, really need to check. <coughs> I need to check only the even powers, which means 1, x squared, x fourth. Is that right? I'll have three equations to deal with, actually, in the end. So let's do that. OK, so fx equals to 1. We plug into the rule. It show, the integral is 2. And then I will have a. 0 plus a1 plus a0, because f is 1, OK? And the next one is x squared. 
So that will give me 2 over 3. What does that give me in the end? So I will have um, a 0 times x0 squared plus well, the mid one is 0 because f of 0 is 0, so I don't need to have it, plus a0 times negative x0 squared. Okay? So what do I have in the end is 2 times a0 x0 squared. It becomes really easy now. And the last one, fx equals to x to the fourth, I will get 2 over 5, and that's a 0 times x to the 0 to the power 4. And this term is 0, and this term will be negative x to the 4th. You see it's the same, so it's just this thing multiplied by 2. So there are still nonlinear equations, but now it's very easy to solve, isn't it? If you take this one <coughs> divided by that, you immediately get x 0 square, right, equals to something you can solve for it, all right? Okay, so let's say this is my 1, my 2, my 3. So if you take 3 and divide it by 2, what do you get? You get x 0 square equals to 5 over 3, and then you know x 0 is negative, no neg yeah, negative, root 5 over 3. Is that a 3 fifths? Oh, 3 fifths. It cannot be bigger than 1. It has to be less than 1. I'm wrong. Yeah, it's the numerator and denominator. You're right. I have to flip it because they're in the denominator. So 3 over 5. Mm -hmm. And which gives you immediately x2 it takes the positive value of that because it's symmetric around, right? And uh, once you have this piece of information, you can plug back in and get a0 and then find out what is a1. Is that okay? I'm not going to go into the details. So a0 equals to a2 would be, um, in the end, it's 5 over 9 and a1. You can figure I'll use the last equation. That will be 8 over 9. Okay. And then you can plug back in and write out your rule. Is that okay? So this will be a fifth order approximation, right? So the rule is fifth order in the end, because that's the m. m is that value. Is that okay? Would you be able to carry out some similar computation like this? There'll be problems similar to this in the homework. If you bumped m into even higher, m equals to um, 3 and 4, the rules are given in the lecture notes. There is a table of all the nodes and the corresponding weights. Okay? And I will not go through that. But there are tables of even higher m's, but again, since we say the higher order polynomials is not a smart way to go to, you, you would just uh, stop after certain values of n, and equals to 3 or 4 shall be big enough. If you want it really to be more accurate, you cut it into smaller intervals to go the other way. Okay. So, um, one last thing though, we're not really done because um, this is derived on the interval from negative 1 to 1. What about in your real numerical integration, when you cut it into each sub-interval, it's not from negative 1 to 1. It's some generic number from xi to xi plus 1. Is that right? So we need to transfer it back. Okay, so um, we need to um, project it. Okay, let's say transfer, whatever, back to a generic interval. Like I could write xi, xi plus 1, but let's just write ab. It's shorter to write. It's just a notation. Okay. 
So what I will be doing will be just use this linear transformation, which you have seen before, a linear transformation. that would map the interval negative 1 to 1 onto an interval from A to B for any A, B value. Okay, so let me write this out for you. So T equals to 2x minus A plus B over B minus A and x. So x and T are related by this linear relation between them I can write t as a function of x, and I can write x as a function of t as well. It's just linear, so the reverse of the slope and the intercept. Okay, so this is a linear transformation. I need to understand now, if I have the t value between, is on the interval from negative 1 to 1, and I do this transformation, what values will x take? What interval will I have, the new interval in x? x will be on what interval? How do I figure this out? Well, you first recognize this is a linear transformation, isn't it? x is a linear function of t. This is a number, and this is a number, right? So if that's the case, all you need to verify are the two boundary points. See where the two boundary points land, that all the intermediate ones will land in a corresponding intermediate place. Is that right? So when t equals to negative 1, what is the x value? t is negative 1, what do I get for x? The b cancels the b. I get two a's and then multiply by a half, right? Do I get a? Is that right? And then when t equals to one, what does the e what does x take? Well, he takes b, isn't it? So this transformation, what it does will be it takes an interval from negative one to one for the t value and it transform it into a generic interval with a and b for this x value. Is that clear? Then you can rewrite your rules. Your rules right now is on the interval from negative 1 to 1. Then you can change all your rules by doing this mapping and find the new nodes, find the new weights. Okay, so let's say um, ti's are the nodes, uh -huh. and ai are the weights on this interval negative 1 to 1, right? As we derived here, so except I now call this ti's, not xi's. Earlier we called xi's. And now we want to find the corresponding xi's and ai, let's put a tilde here, that will be the corresponding rule on the interval from a to b. <coughs> How would I change it? So this is already given, we did the derivation, now we just want to map it onto a new interval. Okay? So the xi's will be taking this formula, putting in the ti. Okay? So let me write, and half b minus a ti plus a half a plus b. Okay, that will go into the interval from a to b, and then you have to change your weights as well, or the ai, because these weights are designed on interval with length 2, 1 minus negative 1. Now your interval length is b minus a. You have to multiply that factor on it. Is that clear? So you have to multiply this factor, b minus a over 1 minus negative 1, okay, onto all the previous weights, these ai's. Then you can apply your rule on any interval. Is that clear? Worse than last time? I thought this is 
easier conceptually. It's just more algebra. Last time was conceptually harder. Are we okay? So is our AI just B minus A over 2? Yeah. I just want to show you where the 2 comes from. So if you're okay, I'll put the 2. Because it's the interval length. It's the rescaling factor. Yeah. Okay, so some concluding remark. Do I still have a minute or two? 3.11. Oh, I am actually ahead of time. The other class I could not finish. Boom. All right. So, um, some discussion, advantages. Well, no, actually some disadvantages as well. Let's, let's discuss some advantages. So how is this method comparing to the previous one, say trapezoid or Simpson? So you can compare them side by side, probably. Trapezoid rule took two points, right, on the interval and it achieved, what's the order of trapezoid rule? Is second order, is that right? A corresponding one, Gaussian quadrature, if you take two points, you get a third order. That's the first one we derived, n equals to 1. And when n equals to 2, the corresponding one will be the Simpson's rule, taking three points, which is a fourth order, but here we get a fifth order. So Gaussian quadrature bumps the order up by 1 with the same number of nodes. Is that right? So higher order. Higher order accuracy. Okay. Bump order up by one is a big deal. <laughs> okay. So what other advantages do you think this can have? <coughs> Have you noticed that um, the choice of nodes, not really the choice, in the end, the location of the nodes are very different in the Gaussian quadrature and to the other method we have seen. For the trapezoid rule, let's take a look at the location of nodes. Mm -hmm. Trapezoid, where are they? On an interval. Well, are the two boundary points, is that right? Simpson. Well, it takes the two boundary points and it takes the midpoint, right? And the Gaussian quadrature, Gaussian quadrature, those that we have seen, the first one we had was <coughs> somewhere inside the interval, mm -hmm, for n equals to two and for oh no, n equals to 1. And for n equals to 2, we have the midpoint and we have some other points, but it never goes to the boundary, isn't it? You can actually show that it never goes to the boundary. So, not at the boundary. Okay, so how do you think this could be advantages in certain situations? You can approximate integrals that have blows up? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Think of, um, think of, say, what do we want to integrate? From 0 to 1, something that blows up at 0 but still integrable. Is this function integrable? 1 over x is not. Square root of x, maybe? x to the negative half, you plus 1 and it is half. Yeah, that's integrable, right? Say, this one, I could approximate with Gaussian quadrature, but if I want to do it with Simpson or trapezoid rule, there's no way program breaks down because it needs the evaluation of the function 1 over x where x equal to 0, right? Then it cannot work. Is that clear? There's some advantages there. But, okay. Some disadvantages, well not really a disadvantage, is like um, 
compensating this higher order accuracy. So remember for the trapezoid rule and for the Simpson's rule, because exactly because it uses the boundary point, therefore for two neighboring intervals when you perform it, the boundary is evaluated more than once. Right? And then we took advantage of that and we don't do the evaluation, we just multiply it by two. Okay. And for Gaussian quadrature, all the nodes are in the interior. So for each interval, these nodes are exactly all the nodes you have to perform function evaluation. So it will actually have more function evaluations to perform. So some little disadvantage. It's not that big. Okay, so so a minus sign for it. So it actually has more function evaluations, but not that much, not that you can justify that it's not efficient because it has higher accuracy, right? Okay, so for your homework for this chapter, I will give you some problems um, one will be directly verifying some rule has certain order degree of precision. Another one will be asking you to design a rule, not exactly Gaussian quadrature, but in a similar spirit. That is, I will fix some parameter there. So um, some nodes are fixed, some are not, and the weights are not fixed. So you will have to check how many degrees of freedoms you would have and to figure out the highest order of accuracy you can obtain and carry out a similar computation as we did today. Do you think you can do that? With the three points or four points, not that many points. Right? So the, the homework is already on Angel and uh, you can um, think you shall be able to do everything now. So la next class we will look at some um, numerical simulation, talk a little about how to write the code for the Romberg. Okay, and then we'll move on to the next chapter.